ideal subject. And yeah, some of these examples will show you some of the uh, realities of soils around here. Cheers, then. Let's have a look at these ones. Let's see what we've got. Uh, yeah, it's a bit indistinct black and white picture from the 1940s. This is a steep, steep hillside, and it's been cut into terraces and cultivated on each terrace. If you think about uh, lots of Asian growing, Chinese growing in the past, that is common. And partly this is to illustrate this point about cultivating along the contour, not digging up and down because all your soil will wash away, but also the extreme measures to which people have gone to in the past to cultivate in very, very difficult situations. So if you think you've got a challenge with your back garden, you probably have, <laughs> but it's not as bad as the whole cultures and civilizations have managed to subsist on cultivation like this in the past. Uh, this is the dust bowl picture where somebody's moved onto the land, built a rather beautiful house, which is now derelict, because all their soil has just washed away in front. So that's a bit of a cautionary picture. Uh, uh, but like I say, I've had students who have been through that experience. This is the chalky soil in Brighton, or excuse for a soil, but it can be cultivated if it's got organic matter added to it. But a lot of the fields down there, where they've been ploughed continuously and cropped for year after year, uh, the fields are pure white now. There's no soil left on them, because as soon as they open them up and plough them, all the soil gets washed down. And again, that's parallel to hydroponics, that some of those farmers, if they didn't put nutrients out of a bag on the field that year, nothing would grow at all, because there's no residual soil. Uh, and that cre creates a dodgy situation. Yeah, this is also in Brighton, where this is actually opening up new allotments. But they're breaking open ground. It, it is nearly that white, uh, there's about a couple of inches of topsoil and then it's just pure clay and they're throwing new growers onto it with no facilities there's no water collection there's barely marked out plots there's no manure provision they've put a fence around the site uh, again, just illustrating the ignorance of bureaucrats who have never done this kind of thing or taken it on uh, and there's various similar things going on in Sheffield but asking people to take on a challenge without giving them any support or backup or knowledge or wisdom to actually go about it with is a bit unfair. Uh, that's my mate John who's worked with me as an apprentice and that's again this chalky Brighton soil but he's made raised, raised beds along the contour, he's pumped it up with organic matter and he's now got, this is within six months of starting on this site, he's got a nice productive set of a lot of brassicas, a lot of mustards, a few lettuce going, uh, so he's cropping already. And one uh, footnote to this is, these are strawberry plants. They prefer growing in acid conditions, as I described. On this chalky soil, they've now got chlorosis. Uh, that means they've got a lack of uh, magnesium, and that's uh, uh, as a result of growing in this very fiery, chalky soil. Not everything likes. And this is a marsh out in the Hope Valley, Marsh Lane, Marsh Avenue it was. But actually, it's a back garden, and somebody had already brought in a load of clay-based agricultural topsoil. So, like we've described with some of your back gardens, if you can work out how long is it since it was last cultivated, and you can do that by the weeds. Uh, so if you've got turf, that's probably been left for at least 18 months. If you've got, this is buttercup growing, it was growing underneath the plastic mulch, uh, even with the light excluded, that's indicating compaction, in this case, because lots of kids uh, were trampling on it, and also slight acidity, but the two do go together. But that's only been there for uh, <coughs> about a year, so it was cultivated before that. And if we think about other, other sites like allotments, if we find brambles growing on allotments, uh, that's likely to have been left for about five years. And this is just uh, a mention of uh, the subject of weeds as indicators that if you can work out what weeds are growing on your site, you can learn a lot, both in terms of how long was it since it was cultivated, uh, has it got especially fertile, like your, uh, what was that? Convolvulus. That is indicating you've got fertility around. Uh, and some of them would also indicate that you've got uh, uh, an alkali soil, uh, different ones. Uh, that's referring to the list in the booklet. So that was what we did with that back garden. Uh, it took about two or three months to turn around and now it's starting to be cultivated 
I'll come back and give you a, a longer description of that one in shortly. Ah, here we are. This is up on Bradwell Moor. Uh, this is, uh, so yeah, this lass came along on, on course. Her parents owned the farm, and there would have been a bit of a trade in sheep grazing about 20 years ago, but they've not made any money out of it for a long, long time. But they're still living there. But this was the farm garden, so it's a stone wall patch, about as big as an allotment. And she took the right advice, got a load of boarding, pegged it in, and got crops going again quite fast. She's now built a nice shed in the corner and had a couple of kids, so she's rather busy with kids at the moment. But that's on the top of a moor. This is, yeah, also in Bradwell, uh, just coming down into the, into the village. At the bottom here, you can see the top of a stone wall. And you can see this is quite a slope about 30 degrees going up the slope and that wall is 8 foot high on the other side and it would have been 8 foot high on this side but that's how much soil has slipped down the hill and probably washed over the wall uh, so all the soil wants digging back up the slope and that's a good principle if you're working on a slope you're digging, you're always trying to push the soil back up against the gravity and re rectify what, 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 what gravity's done but critically if she'd had raised beds like Liz has got nice bits of boarding here, but along the contour, to compensate for the slope, that would have held the soil back. And that was the advice, I don't know whether she's gone through and done it. This, it was, this lady, uh, it was a grade two listed building, and she had rather a big job just restoring her building, let alone her cultivation plot. But yeah, it's fertile, uh, but can be better managed in that case. And also out in the Peak District, this is out at Longshore, which was originally hunting lodge of the Duke of Rutland, and this was his kitchen garden, but it wouldn't have been used year long, it would have been just when they were out hunting to produce uh, a few veg to go with the meat, whatever. And this is a little volunteer group who are starting to open up little, be little beds, and it's a wonderful setup, little greenhouse, they've got a bit of funding off the National Trust, but they're only going to stage one, and they're only producing a kind of base uh, line of what's possible from this space because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking all this turf or paths well I'd have dug that up myself underneath the turf there's more good soil and in this case it would go back 100 years to the last time this garden was well cultivated and that is a bit of a theme to these slides wherever you've got the history of having been productive it's much easier to go back and restore and put that back to productivity so this garden, although it hasn't been used for at least 50 years, it might have been used for 100 years before that or more, and all that time fertility was building up and good practice was the norm before about 1950. This one is up above Habersage, uh, and this is on Leem Lane or Sandy Lane, and it actually used to be an extraction point for sandstone in, out in that area. But it, that means it's very high ground and very sandy soil, so it's going to be very free-draining, nutrients will constantly wash through it. Uh, with planting fruit, that's a line of raspberries, they do, do well in a sandy soil and don't need too much extra fertility. This is a plum tree. Rather than planting apples or pears, uh, which would prefer more nutrition in the soil, more clay, plums will do all right. Uh, they mostly crop during the summer, August, September, uh, and they a lighter crop, but they will need to get a good crop of plums extra calcium and or magnesium putting in the soil because the stone in the middle of the fruit is dependent on calcium, enough calcium to actually form the fruits. So that's a high ground sandy soil restricted as to what can be grown there and actually importing more clay soil would have been good alongside composting and manure. This is also a sandy soil and this is out to the east side of Sheffield on the level ground uh, and in this case it's the one commercial organic vegetable crop that I've ever seen, almost. It's, they had about five acres of carrots, and they'd hired or borrowed uh, a raised bed making machine, humongous bit of kit, and they'd taken all the stones out of the soil and ridged it up into raised beds, and they've got about three or four rows of carrots on each bed. And carrots, at the time, they were about a pound a pound. Uh, they had about ten grams worth of carrots in one field but all at one time, so they've still got to get them to market to actually sell them. And as this group was visiting, over the other side of the field, hundreds of rabbits eating the carrots. <laughs> and just the scale of it, that's their hose, they call it artificial rainwater, and that's their winter mulch that they're going to put on top of the carrots 
to keep them warm so they can still lift them in the spring. And that is, again, a commercial point that if you lift it in the autumn, you'll get maybe 50p a kilo for your carrots. If you lift them in the spring, March, April, May, you're going to get a couple of quid. You'll get several times the amount for the same crop if you can store it in the ground until later. So this is sandy soil, and this one is up at uh, uh, north of Scotland, at Findhorn. Uh, and in that case, that site started out as sand dunes, and then they started composting various forms of organic matter and feeding it into the soil, and they did manage to get things growing. So there's good growing on there. But yeah, let's just look at, this is a sandy soil. Somebody's walked up and down and trodden their feet into it. And almost immediately the rains came and washed it nearly flat. That's another comparison we can make between these different types of soil. If we had a heavy clay soil, it probably wouldn't take the marking of the footprints. But especially think about making raised beds. If I chop a path into this soil, it's going to fall down and into a kind of 45 degrees angle immediately. Whereas if I do that in a clay soil, I can chop 90 degrees down and it will hold that pattern for years without even putting wood on it. So that nature of the soil, how quickly it, whether it keeps its pattern or whether it uh, uh, just falls apart straight away. This is also sandy soil. This is up on the allotments in Crook's Quarry. Lovely view to the north uh, east in that case. And this is the process of breaking open the allotment. We've scraped all the weeds off and stacked them into a heap at the back. And now we're coming back a couple of months later and turning that loam heap. That's all the weeds breaking down. And again, rather than throwing that stuff away, uh, that's recycled. And that is the better part, the more fertile part, of the soil that we inherited on that site, which is a very sandy soil. Uh, that's the same soil, doesn't tell you much from the picture, but we can grow anything on it. Out towards the east again, uh, we've got sandy soils if you go far enough, but also quite a lot of this heavy clay soil. And this is uh, yeah, uh, a, an, an allotment site where they're trying to make a project. They've taken a plough, a big plough, and ploughed the ground uh, but they've ploughed all the weeds in. They've also mixed in a lot of broken glass on the surface there. So that's another thing. If you're using machines, I'm thinking, talking about a rotavator, uh, you don't want to chop loads of uh, contaminants up into your soil. Or if you chop up weeds, you will also be propagating weeds and make it, storing up a problem for yourself later on. So that's a caution about using machinery. And if anybody knows the Morley Street Gasworks site, allotment site at the end of Walkley, uh, the council tried to restore it, but big with, big, with big machines. So the bulldozers have gone over the site, and what was a, a recoverable site is now an irre irrevocably a landfill site, because there's broken glass, brick, asbestos, other contaminants, ploughed into the field, and the big machine's gone over it and pushed that into the soil. It's no good. Uh, and look at the soil here, red... This is at Shirebrook, where I was running an allotment project, and just that red colour is a good sign. That means heavy, heavier clay. And again, in the longer term, that's going to be naturally fertile, especially good for fruit trees, and with the addition of lime and then organic matter, that will increase and turn into topsoil. Uh, got other pictures of that later on. Here's a picture of Unston Grange, and again, beds along the contour. This is one of the examples of what was a tired and worked out soil uh, that maybe had been finished off by chemical use actually it had been active till after the second world war and then put down to soft fruit so this is a big house situation where they didn't have the money to pay anybody to do their growing for them anymore they put a few soft fruits in and picked them for a few years but then they just went to the supermarket but then this was a chance for us to pick up in 94 we started going out there took about seven years to restore all the soils, to turn them around, to make them productive again. And in this case, uh, what had been um, an active clay, uh, uh, an aerated clay, if we dug down, especially in this bit, we found that it had, the clay had settled back and then got waterlogged and turned back into a blue or grey waterlogged clay, anaerobic, no oxygen in it. So that was uh, yeah, a case of sorting out the drainage, getting the beds right, improving the soil with lots of organic matter, and again, that, that, that's become a, a long-term fertile site, easier to grow on. That's the front garden where we planted herbs, and just 
one example of bad practice, oh look, we spent about three or four years removing all the roses, because it was a rose bed, this one. We took out the roses, it was heavy clay, we, we improved it with lime and then organic matter, just enough for the herbs to grow. But then after I left the site, they took out all the herbs and they put bloody black, black plastic down. And they've actually planted plums into here. Uh, that's enough, but yeah, not good practice to cover the soil up. And here's another one. This is out in Totley, the Elms at Door. And this is a historical uh, kitchen garden for a big house. It's actually now used by social services as the day centre. And this is a picture about four years ago when my mate, who now does Workley Hall, had started to restore the soil, but because it's a conservation area, he wasn't allowed to restore the greenhouse. So he's now moved on to Workley, where he's got uh, free reign, and he can put up loads of polytunnels and get the out-of-season crops, which make a bit of money. But yeah, that's, again, how he left the site. So that picture is taken after the previous one. It was active, and it was up and running, and now it's been kind of mothballed and left. One of the points here is that yeah, get on with your, your own growing and your own spaces but there's all these other spaces that used to be used in the past and in this case it was a therapeutic horticulture setup that they couldn't afford to keep going in the 70s but it's still waiting there to be used and if we can get enough people together that could be happening this is up at Workley uh, Workley Hall where yeah, the landowner drank his fortune and, and then <coughs> spent it on cars and because he was drunk he kept on crashing the cars Anyway, and then the fire brigade have got this now fire brigade's union and they keep the grounds and maintain the grounds and it's all lovely house, hotel and you can walk around the grounds they've got the most amazing uh, plants there they've got one of those oaks that you can get inside and uh, other amazing plants but uh, no, they won't do anything with the walled garden and it's a five acre walled garden so Darren negotiated and got in there and now all this lot is polytunnels going all the way down here and yeah the point was when we cultivated when he started to cultivate the soil here hadn't been cultivated for 40 years and as soon as he turned it over he noticed a huge wide range of species growing and some of them the seed had been sat in the soil for 40 years waiting to germinate <coughs> so it was kind of ghost or echo of what had happened a long long time ago uh, that's the process of breaking that open and this is his other site which is Healy Farm and in this case the raised bed and the soil here being artificial in the sense that on this site it was a building site to begin with in the 80s when they took it on so all the soil you see at Healy Farm has been created by composting the manure, bringing in other materials building up soil and that's uh, yeah, in the worst case scenario of a contaminated site, you just level it off, you'd actually seal it in with black plastic and then bring in new soil on top of there. If you knew that you had really bad contamination on the site, you'd have to do that if you were aware of it and you were doing it for public health. And in the case of Healy Farm, uh, there used to be an undertaker's in the top right hand corner and all their chemicals have leached down into the soil. So they do grow just normal trees, yeah, wild trees there, but they're not allowed to grow anything food wise because those chemicals are still in the ground like 50 or 100 years later. They only found that out quite recently. And here's a site that I had a look at and actually got a proper survey done. Uh, this is over at Catcliffe, so Parkway, where you go to the M1, is along here. And just over, this is a huge site. It's about six or seven acres. Again, it's been cultivated in the past as allotments. Uh, this is one allotment it was keeping going. Nobody else interested. Um, and yeah, I was actually commissioned to do a consultation and survey on this and because they were paying me I could afford to get a proper soil test done so I wrote to somewhere called Elm Farm Research Centre where they do proper soil testing I have to go to them because there are no soil science departments left in universities anymore <coughs> and there's no public provision of soil science there used to be a network of people who are out there to advise farmers on what to do with their farm, what, what to do with their soil. And there's been in the past massive campaigns, especially over things like calcified seaweed, to get all farmers to use it because it enlivens the soil, it makes it help, you know, a, a better soil, virtually for any soil. And yeah, this gave me a breakdown of how balanced the soil was on this site. And a bit like some of you this evening, I took one sample from up the top here and one sample from lower down the bottom here. 
And it turned out, the history was, somebody had had pigs on here, because there was loads of potash in the soil. And pigs and pig manure, they recycle potash. Uh, but this bit up here <laughs> was nearly perfect. It was just the right pH. It had all the nutrients it needed. It didn't need anything added to it. So it would have been just a job of clearing off the weeds and laying out plots that people would use, combined with a communal facility down in the bottom corner so that people had the best of both worlds. They had support if they needed it, and also their chance to get on with their own little private thing as well on the same site. And that is essential formula if we're going to have what are called serviced allotments or supported allotments. Uh, you need somebody on site who's doing something, again, valuable, like therapy, and then a bit of an advice service to help people along to get started and create a, a virtuous cycle of people helping each other after that. And just one last code run to this. This site wasn't used for 20 years because just down the way over there, they had Orgreave, and that was where they had the miners' strike. And I'm afraid it's political. They, they don't want it to be active. It's National Coal Board land. And again, this territoriality word, that's part of that same syndrome. That's a perfectly good allotment site. It should be up and running. I've done enough to kind of nudge it. But it, it just needs someone to go along, plough it, do some very basic remedial layout infrastructure, and then another 100 people could be on that site. But uh, that, that's a whole other course, or uh, allotments. <coughs> Here's one. Uh, this is out at Grindleford. And having taught courses at Hope Valley College, some of the students came along on the course and then started an allotment. Actually, they started this one along here. And it's looking down into the valley, so the river is just beyond the trees there. And it looks like a wonderful site. However, uh, it got flooded when they had the floods a couple of years back. So that's thinking about, yeah, sites have their positives and their negatives. Down in the valley, in the summer, it's nice and warm, just from the, the way the, the land is. But uh, if you get a flood, or in the winter, the cold air falls down into the bottom of the valley, so you might like to get late frosts, early frosts and late frosts. So it's a, it's a lovely site. Uh, oh, uh, this is over at the Manor Oaks. Uh, it's a, a restoration of an old farm. And they've done up the farmhouse. They've put a farm shop in. They're trying to flog stuff. But uh, this is the field as they prepared it last year. So they've actually put weed killer down, which you can tell because it's slightly orangey-brown there. And then the white strips are plastic, where they put plastic down, ready for a crop. But they never put a crop in. So all through last year I was driving past and they're never bloody growing anything. And I'm really jealous because they've got that's two or three acres of field and yet they're not doing anything with it. And that project is actually based on composting the green waste, a lot of which comes from the west <laughs> side of Sheffield and is then exported to the man of the east side of Sheffield where they don't really do good composting, they just leave it in heaps. And what you get out the end of it is not, not worth getting. I'm afraid. It's got some humus in it, but it's mostly wood. It's still woody waste. So if you use it, you get a, a, a quick burn of nutrients, and then it denitrifies. It takes nitrogen away from your soil. And they've made too much of this compost now, they can't get rid of it, because it's no good. And so they're dumping it in great big mountains at the end of this field. And quite what they're going to do next, I don't know. But again, they've got great big flashy machinery, half a million pounds worth of machinery, and yet they haven't produced any real good compost and they haven't grown any real good food. So it's that scale thing again. Mm -hmm. They're aiming too big and not achieving the little bit and moving on is from that. Is that the local authority composting, like collecting people's... It is, yeah. They, they're working with the local authority, but it's a hived off, privatised right. part of actually the Wildlife Trust they started off as. And then there was a need to have a separate body for making money, which is called the Green Estate. And they took over responsibility for composting. And then, yeah, this is... Uh, site close to Robbie's, Robbie's shop this world of fun and yeah look they've got some beans growing Hooray! but that's in the middle of the summer and they've still got the bloody plastic down and weeds growing this is in the, the highly intensively cultivated bit that could be you know, uh, really active and really busy and yeah they've got a lovely summer house and a beautiful greenhouse but I went yeah, just a few weeks ago and it's not much better now so this is, we've been discussing it uh, Robbie runs the Weller Hall farm shop but they haven't actually got much produce there because they're trying to think about it commercially and actually commercially, well you need about 50 acres to be commercial in today's market in the future that might change but this process of growing a little bit of everything throughout the season 
that, that, that's what we do as home growers, then starts to have a bit of commercial relevance if we can sell our excesses, that kind of thing. But that's the advice for all of you that don't bother thinking about commercial. It's a dream. Unless you inherit a million pounds and you can buy your own farm, then you might have to contemplate that. But as home growers, we save more than we can ever get in, in profit. That kind of thing. And one more. This is just up Riverland Valley. A lovely lady who's inherited a farm from her, her father again. And she had this idea of doing a calf, uh, but doing it with her own produce that she'd grown herself. So she went through all the bureaucracy of setting a, a cafe up, which is enormous. You've got to get all the right facilities, the right kind. Uh, and, yeah. and then she's cultivated the field. And for one year, they managed to grow a little bit of produce. But then the bureaucrats basically closed her down. They didn't want calf, made it too hard for her. And actually, it was a real challenge to get the right things growing at the right time when people are actually there. So that's been, yeah, others' experience of trying to uh, source locally, and it's not there, or uh, the red tape around doing it is too complicated and it puts you off. And <coughs> this is a school project, Springfield in Broom Hall. Uh, it's had lots of money spent on it. This is five grand's worth of spend, that. And then it's been left in this state... Uh, they did a bit of planting but left it get, get weedy and then I took a group in and in one weekend we turned it around we weeded, all, weeded it all and we left it looking like this uh, oh, just back one sorry man uh, so yeah, this is decent planting arranged in the right place and I gave the teacher a bag of seeds and said all you've got to do is take the kids out throw these seeds on the ground, they'll grow that'll be green manuring Broadcasting it, dead easy, take about 20 minutes, even with kids. She didn't, do, she didn't bother. So that has probably gone a bit weedy again, but we're going to have fruit outside here. It would have looked lovely. Uh, there's some fruit there at the moment. But it's this ongoing uh, contact that whatever you do in one or two hits of visits, you can never achieve enough. Not, not the same as going back there every week. But personally, I don't want to get mixed up with working with schools. Uh, that could be, uh, yeah, there's a, th a, th a thousand jobs there. Every school could do with a little grower attached to them. Some of them got them, some of them haven't. I'm going to overrun by another ten minutes, sorry. And here's Mike's. So, it's a bit of a back garden. When was the wall put in? We've got to, you know, what were they put behind the wall? That's the question for you, Mike. And digging down behind the wall, you should be alright. You've got a couple of, couple of foot behind the wall where the roots, of, this is the apple tree, they wouldn't have got that far all the way to the wall. So you can dig not just the turf off, but dig down into the subsoil, see if there's what, what's below the, just the topsoil. And that could make a lovely edging with herbs planted up, improved, you've got to improve the soil first. But if this is an apple tree, two apple trees, you don't want to dig too close to where their roots are. And yeah, some, somebody else, I think Ruth described you've got such nice azaleas, you don't want to take them out. But uh, I, I might take out one or two myself and leave one or two. But it's been radical again, and my, my judgement is, if it's not produ productive, it doesn't earn its place. So the apples deserve their place, but whatever this is, I might grab that out and put something edible in, that kind of thing. Yeah, might be worth investigating. But yeah, find out how big the root system of the tree is, it'll come out probably that far, and from this side, grow in, in that way as well. All right, and here's something which is more sensible to our scale of, of, of usage and yours as well, Mike. And it's a little herb workshop we did where I've raised my little herbs in pots like I had last week, and then we brought extra potting mixture along and some containers, and we just did a little workshop getting kids to put the herbs in containers and take them home. And so that's something that we can all relate to. Uh, and in terms of looking after some of these herbs, you can grow them in a pot for three or four or five years before you finally move into a, a big enough place to plant that, that kind of thing. So, just, again, that, that uh, scale, that we can all do small-scale stuff like this, uh, some, not all of us can do fields. And, yeah, last couple of slides is just the proof of soil improvement, and it means 20, great big, 20, 30, 40 kilo sacks of soil, leaf mould, manure, uh, and compost that we've imported. This is the Huerta site. Uh, and Mick was down there today, and Laura. And what they left after they built the big building, which is behind us, was just some grit and some dark stuff, which wasn't really soil. So that was 
a starting point, but not a very good one. But we really literally had to bring in soil as well as bulky organic matter to make anything of it. And here's another similar situation. This is top of the Ponderosa next to the University Arts Tower. And that's a little bit of gorilla planting. Again, bringing in uh, soil improvers and plant stock to make a decent little planting there. And this is a hopeful one off the end of last course. Uh, it was December, but uh, one of the students on the last course had a patch of ground, weedy, weedy lawn, uh, that was scraped off, stacked up, weed, uh, weeded, and the soil was brought first into activity, and then I brought along extra leaf mould, manure, uh, and fertiliser, and a stock of plants, so there's now rows of peas and beans, and herbs around the edges, and soft fruit on the back. So that's getting back to our... Uh, uh, a, a small back garden scale. Um, is it okay if I do just a few more? I'll just run through these. Can I have a light, Ed? And a little bit more <coughs> performance value for you. Yeah. That. This is my shackle. <coughs> After digging for 20 years, I destroyed about a dozen pair of boots. So what this is, it slips over and fits in under there and then when I tread on my spade I don't break my boots that's extreme digging so actually I carry that around with me so that I can use it whenever I need it and also uh, a pair of gloves uh, again that's the point about abrading your hands like, so good gloves around if you need them some tools like this big bashing thing you're best off holding that with bare hands so some things, not gloves and then on to spade. That's a nice little Stanley spade, probably made around here. And yeah, as the tool I carry around, I like to sharpen the edge, the leading edge here. So I get a car carburetor stone and I braid it, sharpen it, and get almost a razor sharp edge on there. And I'll show you in a minute, I'm going to show you this one of scraping weeds. And if you do s scraping the weeds up with a sharp spade, it cuts through them like butter, it's dead easy. If you do them with a blunt spade, it's impossible, don't even try. So that's a uh, full-size spade. However, spades were kind of designed about 100 years ago, it became standard. And originally, the spade was supposed to come up to your armpit. So this is now about a foot short on me. And that's partly for the leverage you get when you pull down. And yeah, uh, I'm big enough physically to handle that as a blade and shift that much soil at a time, but that much soil is probably about 10 or 15, 20 kilos maybe. It's a lot of weight. And yeah, I'll repeat this again in a minute, but when I'm turning over soil, uh, after scraping the weeds off, what I'm trying to do is push into the soil and then pull back, which is pushing down rather than lifting up. When I've got a clod of soil on the fork or the spade, then I want to just flip it over on its side. I don't want to lift 20 kilos of soil up before turning it over. All I want to do is get in, pivot down on the soil, and then flip it over. So I don't actually lift it at all. And that's one of many things which, uh, yeah, the, the phrase is, having done that thousands and thousands of times, that is the way to do it. And if you find yourself lifting a bit of soil, fair enough. But if you want to carry on doing it for a long, long time, or, yeah. Uh, a bigger, bigger patch of soil, then not lifting the soil is crucial. This fork is a light fork, and yeah, they're making these with natural wooden handles now, and D handles, which are better than T handles, which split your fingers. Uh, that costs a bit more, but it's worth getting. And another thing about size, that's not the biggest fork you could get, but it's got nice, clean tines, the teeth, so it slips into the soil nice and easily. Uh, same as a, a, a cleaned blade or ever. And then, yeah, uh, I'm not turning over too much at a time, but yeah. So, the difference between the two, um, when I'm first clearing a site, I might use the spade to scrape off and shave off the weeds from a, su a surface. After that, if I use a spade to dig into a weedy soil, every time I ch put the spade in, I'm chopping the weeds up and I'm making them into smaller pieces which I'll never get out and I'll leave cuttings of the weeds in the soil. So as soon as I've got rid of the surface weeds, I'll swap to using a fork 
and like I say, just turn the clods of soil over and go away and leave them for a week or two while the rain, the wind, the frost breaks down, loosens the soil grip on the roots and then if I just come and tread on it or bash it with the fork, all the soil falls off and then I can just tease the weeds up and rake them out of the way I've got a rake here uh, when I'm first starting on a new piece of soil, uh, if it's weedy I'll rake all the old dead vegetation away because I don't want to dig that into the soil because that would create uh, an opportunity for bugs to uh, live on in the soil and I want to get a nice clean soil to start with so rake could be crucial that's got a nice carbon fibre handle so it's very light that's a good one uh, so yeah, that's normal tools however, this turned out to be the very very best tool of all it's called a Chillington hoe and whereas with a fork and a, and a, and a, and a spade you're pushing muscles and like, it's all muscle action what you've got to do with this is just let it fall it drops down and gravity does the work for you and if you're clearing off the surface you're allowed to scrape along the surface if you think about pictures you've seen from all around the world of people cultivating soil that's the tool they use and there's a really good reason for it it's much much easier so you can carry on anybody could use this for a day no problem whereas forking and, and spading you'd be lucky if you carry on for an hour or two you know. they should do some lady sized forks and spades which I admit I was a short person I border forks and border yeah. spades smaller, yeah. Yeah. but yeah it's better to use a smaller spade and lift a little less because if you try and lift, lift too much mm -hmm. then you're going to do yourself in and this is all about preserving your back because yeah a lot of old gardeners that I come across oh I've done my back in I can't do it and yeah if somebody's got a back problem here, I'm not making fun of the back problems, I'm taking it seriously. And part of this is about, yeah, when we're doing physical work like that, it's remaining conscious, either if you've got a little niggle already, or the potential to do yourself major harm, and try to avoid getting into that situation. So remain <coughs> aware that you're doing something which could kind of knacker you. I tend to push it a little bit too far and have a niggle for a couple of days, but that reminds me... Well, next time I do that, I've got to watch out. And then if you're on a really rough soil like Ed's allotment, uh, trying to grub out massive trees, a mattock. So that's a kind of heavy version of the Chillington hoe. But yeah, those are tools. And I'll take it with me all the time. I'll just show you. Oh, no. No. I'll leave that to another day. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great.